um, a voice told me the meeting was being recorded, so that was exciting. Um, so, um, hello everyone, I'm going to be talking about grave goods, objects and death in later prehistoric Britain. Um, the project was um, an Arts and Humanities Research Council funded thing um, that ultimately ran for almost five years in total, I guess, from the beginning to when the book was finished. Um, and um, the idea of looking at later prehistoric Britain was to look across the whole of the Neolithic Bronze Age and Iron Age. You can see um, on the screen a picture of the whole team. Um, so um, uh, Katrina Gibson um, working with me in Reading, um, Anne Wen Cooper working with Mel in Manchester, and Neil Wilkin, um, who's based at the British Museum. So that was the project team, and we've all contributed to um, lots of different elements of the project together, basically. Um, from the outset of the project, um, we always saw the idea of grave goods being a kind of play on words. Um, so obviously these are objects um, in burial contexts, but we also meant it in the way that we wanted to take these items of material culture seriously. It was a grave matter um, to investigate the objects that are found in graves. And that was a kind of play on words that was at the core of the concept of the project, basically. The main two research questions that we had um, were what do we mean by grave goods um, ourselves as archeologists operating in the present? And also what did grave goods mean to people in the past? Um, so those are two you know, core questions at the center of what we did. And the other one was really, can we move from an impressionistic or an assumed understanding of change through time and prehistory to a real one? So obviously archaeologists have a bit of a sense of the fact that, as you can see in those bottom, the bottom set of images, that in the Neolithic by and large, you have disarticulated burials. You go through into the Bronze Age, you have um, um, nice graves with complete inhumations, and then you move to cremation. And then the Iron Age, you have a varied set of burial rites um, that is very reasonable in its character. But we wanted to demonstrate in empirically what's going on. I think someone's got their microphone switched on. So if anyone feels like they've got their microphone switched on, they can switch it off. That'd be great. Fantastic. Um, so, um, oh, or maybe not. This is going to impose severe cost on the Russian there we go, that's quite, gone a bit quieter. Um, so our aim in order to do that, to make do that empirical study, was to construct a database of all material culture found in what we termed formal burial context during the Neolithic Bronze Age and Iron Age within six key case study regions. And you can see the case study regions outlined um, as the, the, the white blocks there. So, so Cornwall and Scilly, Dorset, Kent, Gwynedd and Anglesey, East Yorkshire and then Orkney and Outer Hebrides, which um, we treated as one case study region, but it provides a nice kind of dynamic, um, the difference between the two. We did that to try and establish uh, uh, that what's going on with grave goods across the whole of, of Britain, basically. We also did it so that we could pick up regional patterns and I'll have a, we'll have a look at those um, shortly. Um, Equally, the presence of doing all of that research and collecting all of that data allowed us to find other case studies that we could move on to, to look at in more detail. And right from the beginning, we and, and more and more as we went through the project, the idea was to focus on the entire materials assemblage caught up in burial, not just the fancy stuff that's usually what you hear about in archaeological accounts of grave goods. And probably that became more important as a, an agenda, uh, as part of our agenda, the more we went on. So in terms of what we, we've done, as you, as you know, the project um, is, is over now, really, <laughs> sadly, uh, although it continues, as Susan knows. Um, so we had a couple of conferences in 2018 and 2019. Um, the database is publicly available for the archaeology data service, if anyone wants to um, dip into it. And as I'll, I'll discuss, 
there's so many more things you could do with that data. Um, it was a project that always felt like there would be so much to do and we just had to decide what to do. It was never a question of, will we have anything to say? Will we have anything to look into? Um, the database that we created has also been um, um, re-imported back into historic environment records. So um, it's um, it has updated and provided new information with, within those resources, as well as existing separately as our own database. We wrote a couple of papers in Proceedings of the Prehistoric Society and Archaeological Dialogues that um, are open access, so you can read those um, to your um, at your leisure if you like. Um, and uh, the book from the project um, with the same title was published by Oxbow in 2022. Um, and that is also open access. Um, so you can um, read that too um, for free. Um, you can also buy a hard copy. Uh, the best way to find that, I'll just get a plug in early, um, is to just Google Grave Goods um, ADS. Um, and you'll get to the page that you can see on the screen there. And at the bottom, you can see Project Bibliography. Um, and the links there will take you digitally um, to the papers and the books. If you should be interested, come the end of my talk, which hopefully you will be. <laughs> so as part of what um, the AHRC and wider academia terms um, impact, we also did various things that were to do with grave goods, but were meant to have an impact beyond academia. Um, so um, a couple of years ago, before COVID, so it must be three or four years ago now, um, we created a grave goods trail in the pre European prehistory galleries um, that you can see up on the screen there. Um, we also created a set of um, teachers packs for primary schools um, aimed at primary school aged children um, and their teachers, which feature um, Michael Rosen poems that you might, might, many of you will probably know Michael Rosen as well, um, which you can um, watch um, on, on YouTube if you, if you like, um, you can see the Bronze Age one up on the screen there. And the Boundary Objects Project, um, which Susan mentioned before, um, which um, we've been, has been beyond the original Grave Goods Project. And we've been working um, with um, basically to try and join up information about um, Grave Goods um, and the finds in museums and the sites in historic environment records and in um, Campbell, the national record, um, and also lots of other things, including um, working with Susan and colleagues to um, create trails and enhancing museum um, um, displays and, uh, and having a monthly ancient death cafe. Um, so you can find out more about that on the, um, if you um, Google uh, the Boundary Objects Project. Sorry, I should have had a link there, but I haven't. And I shouldn't have skipped two slides, but I did. But um, in terms of our broad scale results, um, there's the raw numbers on the screen. So in those six case study regions, we collected information about, um, as you can see, over a thousand sites um, with over 3000 graves on them um, and over 6000 objects or grave goods within them. Um, so it's a very substantial data set. It was an awful lot of work, which anne and Katrina mainly did um, to collect that information. Um, and you can see the dots of those sites on the screen. So a lot of information on which to base these broad scale patterns that I'm going to talk about now. Um, so, um, and I'll come on to some more detailed work shortly after that. So, um, this is the basic fundamental plot of the project in many ways. So there you can see um, a graph showing you um, in dark grey the, the number of grave goods through time and in light grey the number of graves through time and you can see the years along the bottom. So beginning of the Neolithic through to the Roman period, basically end of the Iron Age there. And what we've done, or what Chris Green, who carried out a lot of the, the what we what he calls fuzzy modelling, um, is basically to apportion all of those graves and grave goods to um, centuries through that four millennia period, um, and through a com process that I won't go into in detail. But basically, you can see um, the substantial peak 
um, here around about 2000, just after, in both grave goods and graves. So that's the early Bronze Age. Um, and then you can see a very substantial drop um, as the late Bronze Age comes in then a, a plateau and then a massive boom again um, once we get into the Iron Age of both of them, um, but probably um, even more grave goods relative to the number of graves at that point. Another um, um, way of representing our data was um, this plot, which shows um, on the left there is the top 50 grave goods that you get through our study period in alphabetical order. Um, and you can see um, how prominently they feature. So which periods you get them in um, as you go from left to right again across the screen. And again, you can see that very dense middle section is the, basically around the early Bronze Age when we know you get a lot of graves and a lot of grave goods and it gets a bit paler um, through the late Bronze Age and then it gets much darker again as you go into the Iron Age. Um, but some of the things that in, so it's a nice way of seeing the ebbs and flows of grave goods through time. So you can see that in the early Neolithic, you're getting quern stones or mace heads or arrowheads, um, much more commonly, quite a lot of animal remains you can see up there. Um, but perhaps most interestingly is when you look in these pale periods and you can see um, objects like lids featuring quite prominently in the Middle Bronze Age, quern stones, slightly unusual things. And then in that very pale late Bronze Age into the early Iron Age period, you can see occasionally little things like pendants um, or covers, shrouds and wraps, that kind of thing featuring. So you can see what kind of grave goods you get, even in the periods when you don't have very many at all. Um, we're also able to investigate um, regionality um, so that's the same kind of fuzzy plot through time, um, but by our six case study regions. Um, so you can see Orkney and the Outer Hebrides, probably driven largely by Orkney, those of you that, that know the archaeology of the Scottish Islands, um, through the Neolithic. And then suddenly East Yorkshire taking off um, into the Beaker and Early Bronze Age period. And then Dorset taking over. Um, into the Middle and Late Bronze Age, when most other places have very few grave goods at all. Um, and then a massive boon in East Yorkshire, the kind of material that Mel Giles, those of you that might know Mel, has been working on throughout her career in East Yorkshire, that very high red peak, and then that huge purple peak of Kent um, right at the end. You can also look at, we're also able to look at um, what kind of grave goods you get through time? And that's another way of displaying it here. Um, so you can see times going from top to bottom this time. Um, and you can see the different kinds of grave goods that you get. So pots are featuring prominently, um, especially prominently in the Middle Bronze Age period. And basically that's all you get. Um, but in that Middle Iron Age, for example, or the Late Bronze Age, Early Iron Age, you get quite a variety of um, grave goods and you can see this very big black stripe in the Middle Iron Age, which is coffins. So lots of coffins or a, a very substantial proportion of the what we called coffins grave goods, so we can discuss that later, um, were very prominent in the Middle Iron Age, for example. Another kind of thing that we've tried to look at is how rich the richest burials are. Um, so these are box and whisker plots. Um, those of you that know your statistics might recognize these. Um, but basically it shows the, the bulk of the, um, um, the, 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 the finds all within, all, almost all burials had, you can see here, between um, one and two grave goods, and then some extending up to three. But these dots are the statistical outliers. And so you get a real sense that actually um, in the Beaker Early Bronze Age period, this one here, and especially in the Middle and Late Iron Age, you do have some outstanding graves with a lot of grave goods in them, but there aren't that many. So each of those dots is one burial. Um, so you can see all of the burials that have a lot of grave goods as, as those little circles on your screen now, for example. But you can see that, you know, some burials in the Late Bronze Age have quite a lot of fine so that's good 
You could also begin to investigate the relationship between people and things. Um, so up the top there, you can see how we were able to establish which objects were buried with female sex skeletons and which were buried with male. Um, and so you can see slightly disappointingly mirrors um, exclusively buried with female sex burials. Some have been buried with, um, not in our case study regions, but overall have been buried with um, ones that you don't know. And on the white right, weaponry, very heavily dominated by male burials. Down the bottom there, um, we're looking at um, the percentage with children in green or with older adults in purple. Um, and the different kinds of finds that you get with those different age groups of people. So you can see over on the right there that chariot and horse gear, mirrors, things like that are, are never buried with young children. They're only ever buried with older adults in quite substantial numbers. Um, and it just gives you a little bit of insight of the kind of things that people felt was appropriate to deposit with the dead, that kind of idea. You can also look at those kind of issues um, in terms of um, the sexed burials that we have. Um, so uh, you can see the blue males and red females, um, but it's a little bit different. There's, there's either number of bodies with grave goods and the number of grave goods with bodies, basically. Um, so you can see a peak in male burials in the very early beaker period, and then actually a, a, an unexpected peak of, of grave goods with um, females in the, the Middle Iron Age, basically. We can also get to other patterns. Um, so this, for example, is showing us um, the change in burial right. So you can see cremations in red and inhumations in black there mostly inhumations through the Neolithic with a low level of cremation. And then as we get into the Beaker period and early Bronze Age, there's a very um, well-known, well-established shift um, over to cremation as inhumation drops off, a very high peak of cremation, and then they swap over again. So it's just nice to be able to see in the long term the ebbs and flows of the kind of burial practice that's going on obviously in our just our six case study regions, but arguably representative of the, the of Britain as a whole. So um, now I'm going to um, uh, focus in a bit more detail. That was the broad scale patterns um, that we achieved of the project, but I'd like to just talk in a little bit more detail about a couple of things. Um, so on the right, hopefully you can see on your screens the, the outline of, of the book, and that's just me having grabbed the, the contents pages. And I'm going to focus on chapters, bits of chapters seven and eight, um, to talk to you about those two things, material mobilities and Neolithic complexities, which is what I'm going to turn to first. So um, we talked about this idea of a formal burial context and once you start looking at grave goods in detail it gets quite um, tricky to, um, to um, know exactly what you mean by a grave or an eye or a burial but here um, this um, the reconstruction of the burial from Barnack in Cambridgeshire in the British Museum um, in many ways that's what you might see as an I see as an ideal burial with grave because it's got a grave cut around the edge it's got a complete articulated skeleton in it, so one person buried in a crouched position. It's got some very clear grave goods that have been placed around the body, the beaker down by the legs, and the, the dagger and the wrist guard, um, and um, up by the arm. So that, in some ways, is an ideal burial with grave goods. In the Neolithic, it's much more difficult, and it's much further away from what you might say was an ideal situation, for a grave goods project. And I've, I've just focused on this image of West Kennet Longbarrow, um, uh, a very well known chambered tomb, tomb um, in, in Wiltshire. Um, and you can see there, I like it because Piggott's plan. Um, so all, you can see very clearly all the human bones around the place. And I've just put the square around this little arrow pointing to a windmill hill bowl. So there's a grave good in there, but there's, it's not directly, it's not whole, it's not in a straightforward grave cut. 
it's not straightforwardly associated with one person and all of those people are fragmented anyway so you're a very long way from that ideal and that's essentially the reason why we called um, the Neolithic was problematic for our database because our database which you can see a screenshot of there was set up to record objects in graves with people and obviously it's not that straightforward always in all periods but for the Neolithic it was particularly complicated and difficult to to work out and um, and deal with in a grave goods database um, but because of that, that's probably why some of the left hand side of the plots that you've seen is, are very low because of the Neolithic being problematic in that way. Um, but equally, because of that, I wanted to dig into this issue in a bit more detail um, and think about whether we could see grave goods in the Neolithic and what was going on with this and why if even if it's problematic what can we do with it what, where can we go with it what can we how can we try and understand grave goods in the neolithic so um I, I did a bit of reading as you might imagine um and right back to um thurnham um who actually excavated um the the top northern chamber in west kennet um by the by uh, but he's writing in 1869, and, and I, what the, my point in having this on the slide is to make the point that people have been kind of doing down grave goods in Neolithic um, concepts for a long time. So Thurnham writes that the rarity of objects is remarkable and leads to the inference that those which have been met with have seldom been deposited intentionally or a necessary part of the funerary rites. So he's saying they're very rare, and even if they're there, they probably weren't put in as a kind of grave good form part of the funerary process. Fast forwarding 150 years, that's still the kind of narrative that people are putting forward. So you can see some quotes from um, various recent books um, talking about how finds other than human bones are rare that you hardly have any grave goods as Richard Bradley says at the bottom there artifacts are not common at most of these monuments and what I'm arguing is that all of these statements are not true and it's not because these authors are, are bad archaeologists or or being in purposefully naughty or, or misleading it's because the Neolithic has somehow accrued this bad reputation um, which has persisted and it's not actually true and I want to to delve in a little bit of detail in this first kind of case study um, about um, um, why that is. I think, and you can see on the screen there, the reasons why I think that is. It's partly because people get um, bamboozled by the amazing, impressive um, human bone assemblages in these sites. Um, so they see, low, as you saw in that West Kennet um, drawing before, there's loads of human bones, they're really interesting, there's lots of people buried, it's very um, um, visually impressive and, and archaeologically impressive, I'm sure, if you ever get to dig one of those sites, which I haven't. Um, the other side of the coin is that once you get through the Neolithic into the early Bronze Age, as we've already seen in some lots of those plots that I showed you, the early Bronze Age grave assemblages are the most impressive. So in comparison to Bush Barrow, which we have on the screen there, with its gold and its massive copper alloy daggers and axes and things like that. The Neolithic does look impoverished. The other issue is that antiquarian investigations were responsible for the excavation of lots of Neolithic chamber tombs and long barrows and that led to a loss of contextual information and so people don't think they understand what's going on and maybe even some of the grave goods were lost. So that's been problematic. And then the final thing is this idea of the temporal complexity through ne which Neolithic grave goods accumulated. So I'll come on to that in a minute. But what I want to say is that a sustained investigation is possible. It can give us insights into mortuary practice and beyond the human remains that people have done an awful lot of work on for the Neolithic. And it also importantly helps us to, as I said, right at the beginning in one of my first slides, to think about what we mean by this idea of grave goods. Um, ourselves as archaeologists and people interested in archaeology in the present. So um, a couple of concepts just to think about before we get into the detail is Laurent Olivier's idea of multi-temporal sites. So these tombs 
um, had multi-temporal qualities. They, they weren't a grave that someone got put in, covered over and left until archaeologists dug it up. They were explored in and out, in and out over possibly even centuries and millennia. Um, and this idea of the grave grid, as we'll see at the end, needs to be stretched for the Neolithic. So just to give you a little bit of that um, big scale data, here's the information from um, our database about the different case study regions. And you can see there, um, on the left, you'll see it says number of sites. So this isn't numbers of grave grids, it's the number of sites on which you get these objects. I won't go into detail, but it was too complicated to count the number of objects or it wasn't representative. So you can see that actually in all of those regions, grave goods are relatively prominent, particularly in East Yorkshire and Orkney. So we are talking about objects and tombs being relatively common. I wanted to jump um, to Univale Chambered Cairn in North Uist um, as a really fantastic example of the kind of thing that you can see happening with grave goods once you look in the right way and once you have the right amount of data to work with. Um, and um, so it's a, a Hebridean um, chambered tomb. It was excavated by Lindsay Scott in the 30s and then it was subsequently discussed in detail, as so many things were by Audrey Henschel, um, in her The Chambered Tombs of Scotland, Volume 2. Um, and because of the excellent excavation and Henschel's excellent description, we can actually end up saying a lot about this site. So there's Scott's um, original site report plan of the tomb. You can see the entrance area here. Um, and then you can see the main kind of chamber on the right hand side. Um, and so they talk about, Scott talks about a kist like box that you can see there at the top, hopefully. Um, and this is how it was found when excavated um, in the 30s. So you can see that uh, the box, the area A2, had the remains of the upper half of one person and the partial remains of another person within it. There are other piles of bones um, in area A1, so individuals three to five potentially. There are burnt patches and charcoal, there are some quartz and flints, a pumice pendant, and then 22 pots that are those um, circle numbers within circles that you can see on the plan. And the pots seem to be a, have been a key element of the grave goods that were put in that tomb. So, um, and I think it's worth, when we're talking about this, turning to Henschel um, and her description. So I'm gonna read it out um, at length because I think it's really important to engage with this description because it's such a helpful description. So Henschel talks about, it's clear that the ritual, so she's meaning the putting people in the tomb ritual, involved placing one or more vessels in the kist with each burial. So they're putting the vessels up there in area A2 um, and um, against the kit out, and probably another vessel outside the kist against the chamber wall. And then what she thinks happening is that as people decompose and, and get disarticulated, they move them out of the kist area over to this southern area and when they do that with the person they move the the pots as well so these are the images from the site report real pots in that tomb once the pots have been placed against the wall of the chamber they've not been disturbed according to what what scott found when he dug it so one was found unbroken and two more though though broken were unscattered the center of the floor was much trampled and the relatively few sheds were small probably dropped while moving the broken vessel from the kiss in the kist, again, when excavated, were two broken but nearly complete vessels, which is assumed had accompanied the last burial. So the end of this temporal sequence, the pots get left in that, the sort of primary body and grave good zone. And then that's the end of the tomb for whatever reason. So they never got moved into the rest of the chamber. So in Unival, arguably, you can see very clearly pots being put in with people as essentially grave goods. You can see that because of the character of those Neolithic practices in the first place. They, they, in, at Univell, um, in North Uris, they chose to put pots in with people. They accumulated and they got preserved quite nicely by soil being introduced into the site later. They were really carefully excavated and thoughtfully reported on, so we get a good record and a good account to work with. 
Um, and also Audrey Henschel in particular, um, her interpretation is creative, it's, it's, in, it's imaginative, but it is also based on the material dynamics within that tomb. So there's a really good idea that are set on, based on the evidence, but have but making creative use of that. So just to look a bit more, with that example of Unival in mind, we'll just have a look at the main other regions just quickly to give you a sense of the Neolithic practices elsewhere before we move on to material mobility. So jumping over to Orkney, um, there's a, a lovely photo of Isbister, the Tomb of the Eagles being um, excavated. I love that picture in this sort of um, ethereal sunlight um, lighting up the chamber. But Hedges in writing up that site in the 80s um, makes a really good point. I like the, the simplicity with which he puts it. So he says the difficulties in interpreting the deposits in chamber tombs is generally recognised for chambers are likely to have been used for a very long time. Thus the apparent association of objects can be misleading. So going back to the idea of that, because they're in use, you don't know, you can't really directly associate people and objects, grave goods and bodies with each other directly in these Neolithic contexts. But if you use a bit of imagination, as we just saw, you can begin to understand that there may have been grave goods and how they worked. So in Orkney, I won't go into detail, all sorts of things happens to human bones, lots of different kinds of animal bones are, uh, are, are incorporated in these tombs, including eagles in that site, um, subsequently later on, otters, dogs, things like that. There's quite a lot of pottery, um, but intact vessels are rare, unlike Unival. There's lithics and there's other bone, uh, other things like bone pins and shell necklaces that you can imagine being worn on people's bodies at the time they were buried. So taking some images from Davidson and Henschel's, um, again, um, detailed reporting on Orcadian tombs, you can see some whole pots in the miniature chamber at Tavisso Tuic, for example, or you can see a couple of um, axes placed on a, on a bench in the car for V-Day Long, or you can see some limpet shells probably forming a necklace um, buried in the, 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 one of the chambers at the Tomb of the Eagle Isbister. Also there, as Hedges discusses in his report, that big dump that I've ringed in red, at which you can see says so skulls and bones in the plan, but also pottery right in the middle there, hopefully you can make it out. Um, and what Hedges argues is that actually, even more, much more complicated than the dynamics we saw at Unival, pottery is being introduced with people, then it's been taken out, burnt and brought back in the tomb as some part of some convoluted ritual to do with cleansing and that kind of thing. Going down to the main area of the Cotswold 7, I'm not gonna go into detail because Darville's covered that and we don't have to worry and it wasn't one of our case study areas. But um, basically there's similar complexities and probably overall slightly less material culture to cut a long story short. So we've already looked at the vessel that was in West Kennet. There's a reconstruction of it in that photo. And another classic example um, is the flint napper as he, he's often called, which is one of the last burials um, put into Hazelton North. And again, you can see hopefully that there's a flint core by that arm and a hammer stone by that arm. And the interesting thing about this burial is it was basically what, essentially the last one that was put in the tomb. So as we saw at Unival, it wasn't disturbed. And so the relationship between that body and the grave goods wasn't subsequently broken down as we see so often is the case in all of those other Neolithic tombs. Jumping over to the Yorkshire Wolds, which is great because there's a different kind of temporality there. And that's because they're not chambered tombs, they're not multi-temporary in the same way because of the chalk subsoil. People basically make burials, dig a grave, cover it over, and then maybe make another one and build up a, 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 a whole tomb, as you can see in that section there. Um, but actually the graves are remaining intact. They're not constantly um, accessed. And you can see the famous finds from Dougalby Howe, um, I've taken a scan of the images of the grave goods from the report and you can see that which burials they're going with on the screen. Um, so you can see all sorts of things that we could very easily call a grave good going into Dougalby Howe with these Neolithic burials. Um, but because of the nature of the architecture, 
which doesn't have that multi-temporal aspect to it, you can actually still see the grave goods with the person. So again, it's a certain set of circumstances that have enabled us to see these Neolithic grave goods. And you can also see it at sites like um, Garden Slack 81 on the right there, which they um, took out whole. And you can see a scraper by the chin of this body. Um, and interestingly, a, a, a flint knife that seems to have been replacing a missing part of the foot down the bottom there and various other um, grave goods on the left. So ultimately for the Neolithic, I hope you get what I'm saying about this multi-temporal character. Um, so grave, and once we look and once we try hard and work through the evidence, you can see that grave goods were often there, but they could get fragmented um, through the general use of the tomb and the movement of bodies and things around them. Um, but all as just like the, um, the relationship between the bodies and the artifacts could, so in this case, you might say that the idea of a grave good needs to be stretched for the Neolithic. Um, so um, in this case, people have talked a lot about bodies bro being broken down and you've seen all those disarticulated skeletons. And people have talked about the idea that once you died and you became um, uh, broken down into bones and then moved around, you weren't straightforwardly an individual anymore you're part of the generalized community of the ancestors um but um in that case it's possible if that was true then grave goods might have been going in with per one person but they weren't necessarily for one person so even if they went in like we saw at Unival with a person the pot and its contents might have been meant for all of the ancestors and people in that tomb so it gets us to think about what a grave good's doing and how it might not necessarily, especially in the Neolithic, we speak about an individual, it might be more than that. So in that sense, some grave goods might have been being deposited for, for someone centuries after they themselves were deposited. So it really helps you to think through this idea of, you know, the different ways that grave goods could work and the different ways they could be understood. So on to the second kind of case study detail of material mobilities. So you'll remember from that plot, the very high peak um, around the early Bronze Age. And in the early Bronze Age, you do get, as well as getting lots of grave goods and lots of burials, you get lots of um, fantastic um, um, artifacts generally, which most often are captured archeologically in graves. And you can see some um, fantastic things on the screen there, gold discs and um, faience beads and jet and amber necklaces and that kind of thing. Lots of what people have generally called exotic materials come in in the early Bronze Age. Relative to the Neolithic, I think this is a step change in the way that people and things had a relationship, but we can talk about that at the end if you like. Um, because of all these exotics in the early Bronze Age, archaeologists have also often drawn on the work of Mary Helms, who wrote a book called Ulysses Sale. And she talked about in the ethnographic present she was writing, but archaeologists have drawn on her work to understand the prehistoric past. So she talked about people voyaging across the sea beyond the known world, basically. And it wasn't just trade and exchange in an economic sense, it was acquiring things from a different cosmological realm, from places that people didn't know. Because they'd come from places that people didn't know, and maybe even were mythical kind of places, those objects that came from there had value, and maybe even supernatural powers that were acquired as a result of those mythical places, having come from those mythical places. Um, and this is the kind of narrative that lots of, especially Bronze Age archeologists have talked about and given in terms of those exotics. And what again, what we want to do is shake things up and question it a bit and think about whether it's really true and whether we can get a more nuanced and different understandings of that period and the objects that feature in that period. So going back to the Grave Goods database again, you can see that the different materials that we've classed as exotic and it doesn't necessarily, it's not really meant to be a loaded term in this instance. Um, it is just things that we can tell were likely to have not to have been derived locally, basically. Um, 
So we know that amber came from the Baltic, for example, and coral probably came from the Mediterranean, and gold probably came from Cornwall. So you get that kind of idea. So when you get those substances in regions where they don't naturally occur, you would say that they're exotic in that sense. And you can see the exotic materials as we've turned them broken down by case study area in that picture. And there's a map um, that I created in order to try and show the, the, the way in which those materials were moving around. So you can see basically an empty picture for the Neolithic, unfortunately, um, because things were not moving around. All of those objects we've just been looking at were basically local to simplify a slightly more complicated picture. Whereas in the Beaker and Early Bronze Age period up the top right, you can see um, the circles are the source regions of those exotic materials. So shale, um, uh, tin and gold and, um, and uh, jet are the circles. So those materials are coming from those circles. And then these arrows represent amber and things like that coming from afar and steatite coming from Shetland, for example. And all the, the, the heads of the arrows are where actually these exotic objects have been found. So you can see basically objects moving all over the place from all sorts of different directions. You can see something a little bit comparable in the Iron Age, but perhaps not so much and more of a kind of channel continental focused directionality. So sorry to give you a slightly unpleasant graph in a way. Um, so this is each region by period basically. And the black bars are the number of occurrences of local objects that were probably local. So let's say quartz in Cornwall um, and non-local is the, the pale gray, yeah? And you can see in this graph that the local things vastly up, outnumber the non-local. And um, in the Bronze Age in particular, you can see that those black local things are outstanding by miles relative to the exotic. So you get loads of quartz that's local to Cornwall, loads of sandstone local to Dorset and loads of jet, which while it was one of our exotics, is not as exotic when you know that it comes from Whitby, um, just down the road from East Yorkshire, basically. So actually those local materials are vastly dominating um, as grave goods in those regions. So for example, in Cornwall, um, you get quartz incorporated into barrows, um, as you can see in Karvanak here, that amazing quartz core of that barrow that's been excavated there. Or you get, that's a kist eroding out of the cliff at Harlem Bay, and you can see a massive lump of quartz placed in the kist alongside the burial um, in that. And also another nice Middle Bronze Age kist burial at the top there um, from Constantine Island, just around the corner from the Harlem Bay site and a selection of the quartz pebbles that have been placed in with that burial um, in that kist. So very local materials, they've specifically been placed in the grave, these things, and they're obviously saying, giving a message about um, that person and their relationship to these local materials in death. We see a similar thing going on in Dorset with sandstone lids. So we had 36 in our database, but we also had 68 stone lids, which were almost certainly local sandstone lids. It just didn't say in the report. And we are very, um, we suspect deeply that lots more had been discarded because not everyone would have kept a natural stone that was merely capping the lid of a pot. And one of the best sites, Simon's Ground um, um, in Dorset, um, excavated in the 60s with loads of cremations, as you can see up the top there. Um, it's an excellent example of this. So you can see on the screen there, um, pots with sandstone lids um, plonked on top of the pot in both cases. Um, 29 of those we had, so lids on top of urns, covering cremations mostly. As well as those lids, you also got um, cans of sandstone on the bases of inverted urns. So they put the urn like that, and on the base that's upright, there's a can of sandstone. You've got empty pits in the, this grave, this cemetery site with pebbles in. You've got spreads of sandstone marking the position of groups of burials. Um, and you've got lumps in some of the, the ring ditches around the barrow. So lots of sandstone 
intentionally placed in all sorts of different ways across that site. And as White said in his site report, in the vast majority of instances, the pots were incomplete. Um, and it's interesting to note that the upright ones lack their rims and the inverted ones lack their bases. So it seems like the, the urns were only partially buried to mark their position clearly. So you can see very nicely in that picture there that maybe what's going on is that actually these burials were in the ground, but they were poking out a little bit. And actually these sandstone lids might have been allowing people to access the bone after they'd originally been buried, maybe to take some out, maybe to add some more in and mix people together, that kind of idea, which is something that, that Joe Brooke and others have talked about for the Bronze Age recently. But perhaps more importantly, um, for what we're talking about today, what's going on in terms of this presencing of local materials in the grave? And again, White talks about it in the site report. He talks about this brown ferruginous sandstone brought from the lower levels of the Bagshot series that are down in the Star Valley below the site. Sandstone's found in the fields of the valley there, but not commonly. So what he's saying is that, they, that the community had a source of sandstone, but they must have been operating in the river valleys in, within the local area of the site, but not immediately. And they brought those stones up to the site and incorporated them into burials. So it's like what we're seeing with the quartz in Cornwall, for example, that they seem somehow it's important to place these local, they're not even really artifacts, they're items of local stone are acting as grave goods because it's important to presence the local and the local materials and the local landscape in people's burials for whatever reason. So I think in summary, um, um, you could say that the even the exotic started local. So we see that jet is most prominent um, in near to Whitby, where it's from, and maybe it gets popular in burials um, in that region. Then it gets exported, and then it gets counted as exotic in both senses of the word. So it's from far away, but people view it as special. But arguably, and I think statistically, certainly local materials were much more significant in graves. So we mustn't get kind of um, distracted by the amazing, fantastic bling of the early Bronze Age that you can see down the bottom there, when we're trying to think about the reality of what people did with grave goods and put in graves. And actually often local materials, humble materials, even unaltered materials and stones, were arguably much more significant. And it's quite a meaningful and deep thing to think about if you think that's what's going on. Some have argued that it was just functional, of course you'd get local stone nearby, but others might say that they had special qualities because of their association with the local area. And maybe it was important to, to give that person in that burial something of the local landscape to take with them into the afterlife or just to be present in that burial. It wasn't always about showing off fancy things. It was about showing small scale, local and touching um, items in the grave as well. Um, so um, just to finish, um, a reminder of the, um, ex the things that you can find about, out about um, in the Grave Goods book. Um, that's the, the, the different chapter headings and the kind of things that we look at just to, in case it takes your fancy um, and a bit of advertising, as I said, free, free to all that, that want to download it. Um, and that just remains for me to say thank you to you all um, for listening. I think I'm going to try and stop sharing now, Susan, um, and see if anyone has any thoughts or questions that they'd like to share with me. So thank you.